I'm trying to make some sense of it all, but I can see it makes no sense at all. I'm just one guy with a cell phone and a banjo. Is it possible that I could make a difference? Is it possible that I could take a rock song and convert it over to bluegrass? Is it possible that I could help out my fellow pilot and maybe help out my fellow fare paying citizen that pays money for a ticket to ride on an airline? I think it is. I think it is possible. Or maybe I'm just too stupid to know that I can't do it. Maybe I can. So the date doesn't really matter, old accident or new accident, our government board members, jokers and clowns, lawyers and politicians. This is a first in a series of eight videos, so hang with me on this series of back-to-back -back identical footprint fatal aviation accident stories. Put your seatbelts on, this is going to be a rough ride. Clowns to the left of me, jokers to the right. Here I am, stuck in the middle with you. Clowns to the left of me, jokers to the right. Here I am, stuck in the middle with you. My name is Dan Greider, and you're watching you. Probable Cause. sleeper plane crashes in a Georgia pine woods, barely five miles from Atlanta, its destination. Seven are dead, nine injured. The crash occurred about 1 a.m. Critically injured was Captain Eddie Rickenbacker, the airline's president and America's greatest World War ace. His airline before this crash had had only one other fatal accident in 11 years at four times won annual safety citations. It's February 28. 2021 it's a big day 80 years since the crash of the dc-3 in atlanta georgia turns out it's only about six miles from my house the crash site is lived here all this time never really knew very much about it until a few years ago so this kicks off the series this is eight in a row wham bam uh with the same theme this uh, dc-3 crash from 80 years ago it's still amazing the parallels that we're going to draw off this. I hope you'll hang with me to the end uh, because this is an exciting one. So let's back up. I'm going to start with how our government started when we first started flying airplanes. I got an on-screen graphic for you. I'll show it right here, but I've actually got the capability now to show it to you on your screen. Real quick, the Department of Commerce, uh, the aeronautics branch started in 1926 through 34. Prior to that, there wasn't really any rules regulations or aircraft accident investigation, but it's long about uh, end of the 20s. People started using airplanes for passenger pay. The general public was able to buy a ticket to ride and things started to get crazy. Aeronautics branch was in existence from 26 through 34. The Bureau of Commerce took it over in 1934. They ran it from 34 to 38 and they didn't do a very good job and they definitely needed some help and everything got revitalized the Civil Aeronautics Authority Act of 1938 was formed uh, when they formed the, the Aeronautics, the CAA, in conjunction with the Air Safety Board. So they were two separate entities, the CAA and the ASB operated independently. The Air Safety Board was in charge of investigating accidents and improving safety. The Civil Aeronautics Authority, the CAA, was the predecessor to the FAA, and their job was to issue pilot's licenses and figure out rules and regulations. The CAB was formed after it became an independent agency under rate organization plans numbers three and four of 1940. Effective on June 30, 1940, due to a merger of CAA and ASB. So the Civil Aviation Authority and the Air Safety Board became the CAB, the Civil Aeronautics Board, is the sum of those two. Once they had the CAB, the very first accident happened, their investigation was led by the CAB, and that was in 1940. Shortly after that, the DC-3 that we're talking about, it's a Douglas sleeper transport, a DST, 
built in Santa Monica in October of 1940, so it was brand new on the line and ready to go in 1941, February of 41. And that's what we're going to talk about next. The uh, First of all, we're going to talk about what things were like back then. Uh, I've done a tremendous amount of research, and I want to give you a snapshot of, of what was going on back then. Before we had all this GPS and fancy navigation stuff, we had a method of finding the airport. We still had fog and rain and low vis back then, and we still had to get the airplanes through. So they devised a system called the AN radio range, and it was comprised of a big antenna located near the airport. I'm going to show you the graphic for that right now. The AN range that these guys were navigating off of that night was called the AN range, and it basically sat about two miles southeast of where Atlanta Hartsfield International Airport is now. In those days, they didn't have any east-west runways. They had the little terminal, and runway 31 was snugged up against the terminal, kind of where the general office for Delta is right about now today. I've got a map of exactly where that runway 31 was, but just southeast of there was the transmitter. And I actually found the transmitter site, the location of where it used to be, and Excuse me. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Your 9 a.m. surgery has canceled. Uh, the open heart I was going to do? Yes. Did they say why? I, I think they're on to you. They, they know that you're not really a surgeon. Uh, did you show them my business card? Yes. Okay, well... I'm making a video right now. I'll uh, um, tell them I'll call them back. I just offer them a discount and tell them I'll call them back. Might work. We're taking credit cards, right? Yeah, just Visa though. No American Express. I got it. <sighs> Sorry. The CAB had this uh, antenna system. Basically, you had to come in on a beam, and they called it flying a beam in those days. So the localizer center was on this map that I'm showing you right now, and that thing was on a 315 magnetic. So here's what's fascinating about this. The pilots listened to a tone in their headsets, and you could hear an A, which is dot dash, and an N, which is dash dot. If you were on one side of the center line, you would hear an A. If you were on the other side, you would hear an N. So if you were left of course and needed to go to the right, you would hear an A. And if you were to the right and needed to come to the left, you would hear an N. If you were on the middle of it or on the beam, then you would hear a steady tone. So you could decide whether to turn the airplane just slightly left or right to stay on the beam. And then transversing into this, they called it let down through. They let down through the clouds. And once they get over the transmitter site, which I'm showing you on a map right now, you should get visual someplace in there. They're cleared to go down to 300 feet, still IMC, after they pass the transmitter. Now, there's no guidance after you pass the transmitter. It's two miles, so you're going to make a slight right-hand turn, lower the nose, and come down to 300 and hope for the best. This is a very tricky approach. Most of the time, the weather was better than this, so you didn't need it. But if the weather was down to 300 in visibility one, this was a manly approach. This was very difficult to do. And you had to listen to that dot dash in your headsets for forever. Drive you crazy listening to that. So keep that in the back of your mind. It's an AN approach, and that's what uh, that's what the uh, center line of that thing was. Now, um, the headsets they had were not very good. And it took me a long time to find this crash site. If you Google this, Eastern Airlines Flight 21, there's no information on this thing. So what I did was I discovered a, somebody told me about the Morrow Visitor Center. This crash actually happened in, near Morrow, Georgia. And there used to be a display there. So I stopped in and visited the crash site. Uh, and I'm going back and replicating now because this is like three and this four years ago. Start but, uh, let's take a look at this video clip. I had some Eastern Airlines friends that told me about this location. This is the Morrow Visitor Center, Chamber of Commerce Visitor Center, something like that. 
Morrow, Georgia, and they told me that there was a piece of the Eastern Airlines, Eastern Airlines Flight 21 on display and some information about it. So this is about three years ago that I got started on this project. Uh, and after I drove up here, I talked to the lady inside of here. This visitor center is now closed. The display is gone. I'm not sure where the piece of airplane went, but it's right next to the IHOP on I-75. IHOP had a waitress there with only one leg, and her name was Peg. Um, but IHOP is where she worked, and that's next to the visitor center right here in Morrow, Georgia. So I'm going to uh, take a walk and show you the... Uh, front door of the visitor information center right here I'm a visitor and they had visitor information right here now just to the right right over here is where the Eastern Airlines flight 21 display had an actual piece of bent metal and airplane debris on display behind glass with information from there I went to the Georgia archives because they told me they thought Somebody at Georgia Archives knew something about this. And guess what? Georgia Archives is a mile down the road. So guess where I went? So here I am, just right down the road. Georgia National Archives, right here. This is a big, big place. They got all kinds of stuff in here. And I struck pay dirt when I was here. I've been here three or four times to look at the same map. It's an engineering map drawn by an engineering firm after the crash, which laid out the crash in exquisite detail. So, so coming out of the Georgia records, now I had this JPEG. Let's look at this JPEG. I got this JPEG and it shows exactly how the crash happened. And most specifically, it shows this tree. It's a 22 inch pine tree with damage on it. It's 104 feet off the fence line. Now, the problem is the map, the engineer's map, does not have any overlay to match up with today's topography or today's map. It's a it's one-to-one a -one scale, not one-to-one -one scale, it's a scale map drawn exquisitely by an engineering department. Problem is, they didn't tell, tell us where this piece of ground was in relation to the world. So I had to go back and look through all the Clayton County records and old aerial photographs, and I finally found the piece of ground that matched up like a jigsaw puzzle, and I stretched out a string from the old fence line where it would have been. I measured out a string 104 feet and walked in, and I was looking for a tree that uh, had damage on it that was around 22 inches, and lo and behold, 104 feet to that side of the fence line, there's a tree. Now, to verify it, I called the U.S. Uh, Georgia Forestry Division, and they sent out a forest ranger to give me an estimation on this tree. The tree is old. It's since broken off. It's definitely a pine. It's definitely 22 inches. Is this the, the tree? This tree has battle damage on one side of it, left over, and the forest ranger was able to confirm that likely this is the proper age and uh, size of the tree uh, th this tree was likely a younger 30 year old tree back in 1941 and it took a hit with the right wing tip hold that thought we'll talk about the right wing tip here in just a minute so where does this localizer center if you're on the beam where does this center lie in today's topography where where does this thing happen the bottom line on this crash is that these guys were just a little bit to the left, of course. If you mapped out center of the beam, they would have been listening to an A and not a tone. They needed to come to the right. Also, it is true they had their altimeters set incorrectly. They were lower than what they thought they were. I believe that's probably a fact. Now, when they hit the, the first pine tree, this, this accident happened in two phases. The left wing struck the top of a pine tree but they were still in the clouds. They were still in the fog. There's no lights out there. There's nothing to see. So all they know is that all of a sudden the left wingtip struck something while they're on their approach. This is still about a five mile final for the localizer antenna. Still five miles southeast, but on the beam or getting pretty close to being on the beam. But they would have been listening to an A and not a tone. They knew 
that they were off course a little bit. They were not center. You're only protected when you're on the center of that. So when they hit, what did they do? They went full power and turned right. Safety is on the center of that beam. They added full power, turned right, and instead of putting the gear up, they put the flaps up. The wreckage was found with the gear down, but the flaps up. Now the topography between the initial impact point and the point where they actually hit is about 1,500 feet. What does the ground do between those two? Turns out it was an open farming, farmer's field at the time. The field sunk down in perfectly matched the profile that this airplane was trying to fly. It was trying to turn right and climb full power. But what happens when you suck the flaps up? The flaps went up and the airplane, it was low energy. The airplane sunk 100 feet down into that valley and tried to claw its way out with gear down, still gear down trying to climb out. They almost made it. They came within about 40 feet of clearing the pine trees, 1,500 feet down range, but they didn't. The right wing was still low and because it hit right wing, it cartwheeled it to the left and this airplane scattered to the left in a debris field that I have mapped out on the map that you're looking at right there. So is it the fault of the pilots for not setting their altimeters? Yes, it is. And uh, they should have verified their altimeters were set. But I want to give you the backstory on everything else we have here. And uh, the, uh, the format that we're going to follow, and I'm going to put this on on-screen graphics right here so that you can see it. Uh, and I'm filling this out right now. This is Eastern Airlines EAL-21. There it is. The board. It's the CAB that we talked about. It's the board that was in charge of investigating this accident. The board was not qualified in the aircraft. They're not pilots. The board has no previous expert experience in this subject. For each one of these eight accidents, we're going to talk about eight scenarios this same piece of paper is going to apply with a different call sign at the top. Board had no previous expert experience in the subject. Board conflict of interest exists. The members are on paid salary, and their obligation is not necessarily to tell the truth. is to protect the interest of the shareholders, the company, and the government to make sure that everything is as it's supposed to be. They're not really innocent, unpaid, non-conflict of interest bystanders. The board misses important clues. They miss so many clues on this one, and I'll show you why. The board finds the wrong probable cause. Then, even back in those days, the board makes the wrong recommendations. What do we do when we have a crash? We study it, we figure out what happened, and we make a recommendation so it doesn't happen again. In this case, they did the same thing, but they made the wrong probable cause, they made the wrong recommendation, and the board makes the public less, less safe. So keep this piece of paper in mind, this same piece of paper, with a different call sign on it, every single one of these eight episodes, I'm gonna have a different one. Now, let's jump to the actual accident report. Report of the Civil Aeronautics Board of the investigation of an accident involving civil aircraft in the United States, NC 28394, which occurred in Atlanta, Georgia on February 26, 1941. Well, the first thing I want you to notice is the time. They keep on talking about that this airplane crash happened on February 26 at around 11.50 p.m. Well, Atlanta's East Coast, and it's on Eastern Time. Atlanta is Eastern Standard Time. They gave it to us in 11.50 CST because it makes it sound quite a lot better, and I'll get to that in a second. Now, it's true that in those days, there was some skirmish over time zone, and what time zone are we really in? Uh, there was a lot of leeway, and it's possible that there are some surrounding cities and even right down to existing farms who could choose which time they wanted to be, eastern or central. Very convenient for the CAB call, to call this 11.50 p.m. It was actually about 12 p.m. central, which is about 1 a.m. eastern. Body time, eastern time, it was 1 a.m. for these pilots. So let's look at who, uh, who was on this flight. Um, actually, before we do that, we're going to talk about the uh, Unqualified Civil Aeronautics Board, the CAB. G. Grant Mason, not a pilot. Robert 
Crisp, attorney of the board, not a pilot. Jerome Lederer, director of safety bureau of the board, not a pilot. Frank E. Caldwell, chief of investigation division of the safety bureau, also not a pilot. Paul A. Gerardo, air safety specialist in meteorology of the safety bureau. And James Payton, investigator in charge of the Atlanta Officer Safety Bureau, also not a pilot. They had all these guys investigating. Three people on the CAB board, none of them are pilots either. None of them had ever flown a DC-3. They didn't know that if you put the flaps up during the go-around, the airplane's going to sink. None of them had ever done it. The depositions of several people were taken, and uh, now we're going to talk about the flight crew. Crew consisted of Captain James A. Perry. You can read this entire report on the link that I have in the description on this video. Download it and read it yourself. Captain James A. Perry, pilot Luther E. Thomas. Captain Perry was 29 years old and had 4,193 hours. Pilot Luther Thomas, age 31 years, had accumulated a total of 806 hours. Check this out. Pilot Luther E. Thomas, his last physical examination was required by civil aviation regulations, was given on February 26, 1941 by a medical officer of the United States Army Air Corps at Mitchell Field, Long Island. Now, these guys are going to fly a very important trip in a brand new DC-3 hauling President Eddie Rickenbacker, president of the company, is on board in a brand new airplane. They send this guy down to Long Island, he's the co-pilot, to give him a brand new physical. They want to make sure he's good. Prior to leaving LaGuardia Field on the day in question, Captain Perry had received about two and a half hours check time in instrument operation during the afternoon. Now, this is Captain Perry, the guy in the left-hand seat. So he shows up at the airport on this big trip. They've been planning this. This is a big one. Captain Perry is going to be captain on this DC-3. He's got a launch on this night flight in bad weather to shoot an AN approach in Atlanta with Eddie Rickenbacker on board. Are you kidding me? Before they send him out, they give him a two-and-a-half-hour check ride. They gave him a two-hour oral prior to the two-and-a-half-hour check ride. I don't know how you feel after you get done with a, a check ride or something strenuous. You go fly a DC-3 for two-and-a-half hours in an instrument check prior to leaving LaGuardia on this field. Captain Perry had received about a two-and-a-half-hour check time in instrument operation. They put him under the hood and flew him around New York to check and make sure he could fly instruments okay. Pass or fail, it's a check ride with your boss prior to launching him. Now, the flight uh, launches about 7.18 p.m. It's sent out at the bottom of the page. It says it took off at 7.21 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. So let's put the pieces of the puzzle here. These guys show up at the airport at 7 a.m. to get working on this thing. One goes and gets a medical down Long Island. The other takes an oral and a check ride. They don't leave... LaGuardia until 7.21 p.m. Now, in route, they notice that the weather ceiling's becoming two to 500 feet after 9 p.m. Um, the required, uh, these reports indicated that the weather at this time was above the required minimum for landing down through, but that an instant approach would be necessary upon arrival in Atlanta. All subsequent weather broadcasts were available to the trip in route. So they know this guy gets to Atlanta now and here's your timestamp. At 11.38 p.m., trip 21, which is our, our accident airplane, 11.38 p.m. Central Time, which is 12.38 p.m. Eastern Time, body time, trip 21 called the company radio operator Atlanta reported passing over Stone Mountain, Georgia. This is a slow airplane. He's coming in over Stone Mountain. He still has to go to Atlanta to the transmitter, hit the transmitter, go southeast, fly 10 miles southeast, do a procedure turn, configure, and come back in. How much time does all that take? Ceiling 300, the, uh, the weather was given to him following the weather report. Ceiling 300, visibility 1, light rain, light fog. Ceiling variable from 200 to 500. How would you like to get this report at the end? It's 1 o'clock in the morning, and you've been up since 7, and you've already taken the check ride. It's foggy, rainy. You got no autopilot. You got no localizer. You're having to listen to this tone to get in. You think these guys were tired at all? This whole thing doesn't make any sense. Eastern Airline trip 21 to Atlanta Tower over Stone Mountain at 11.30 CM, 7 p.m. making approach. We'll give you a call over range station. The Atlanta Control Tower and Miles receipt of the message and transmit of the surface winds. Surface winds are northeast at 10. Now, they got to shoot an approach to the northwest, but the surface winds are northeast at 10. It's pushing them south. 
Now they've got a night, low-vis, foggy, AN range approach to shoot down to 300 feet or lower, and they got a crosswind on top of that. How would you like to get that report at 1 o'clock in the morning? So this airplane doesn't make it in, and at 12.09 uh, a.m., which is 1.09 Eastern Time, then the uh, airport became concerned, and they started launching a rescue team and all that kind of stuff. A survey of the wreckage disclosed, disclosed that while traveling in a northerly direction, so the airplane hit a little bit south of center line, and it did its course. You can see it on the map there. It's turning to the right, and it hits the, the pine trees that we found. Condition of the wreckage on page 8. Condition of the wreckage. They go into amazing detail on the condition of the wreckage. What's the one thing that they don't tell you? What's the position of the gear and flaps? It's the only thing I want to know. Engines were turning up uh, fine. They were chewing through the pine trees. Engines were making full power at impact. Gears down, flaps up. What does that tell you? They added full power. They put the flaps up. On a DC-3, you can't put the flaps up and the gear up at the same time. There's not enough hydraulic capacity to do it, and everything will just drag. The flaps, I don't know who asked for it, and I don't know who did it. I don't know who reached for it. Maybe the co-pilot, just like the Colgan accident, maybe the co-pilot inadvertently reached and sucked those flaps up during the go-around, but that was the kiss of death. They sunk into that valley, and the CAB never figured this out. There's, uh, there's all that now. Uh, we're down to uh, the very end of this thing, the probable cause. It finally got signed by Harley Branch, not a pilot. Grant Mason Jr., not a pilot. George Baker, not a pilot. Probable cause. On the basis of the foregoing findings and the entire record available to us at this time, we find that the probable cause of the accident of NC28394 on February 26th, it's the wrong date, was the failure of the captain in charge of the flight to exercise the proper degree of care by not checking his altimeters to determine whether both were correctly set and properly functioning before commencing his landing approach. A substantial contributing factor was the absence of an established uniform cockpit procedure on Eastern Airlines by which both captain and pilot are required to make a complete check of the controls and instruments during landing operations. This thing is crazy. You want to give a guy a check ride and send him out at 1 o'clock in the morning in fog, rain, to shoot an AN approach? Uh, you got no needle on the cockpit to look at. This isn't giving you left and right. There's certainly no up and down. This is a very difficult approach to do in the daylight when you're fresh with calm winds. This thing at night, no wonder they got distracted and forgot their altimeters. They were busy trying to stay on that course. So that's um, the, the mold that I put this thing in. CAB never figured this out. The aspects of where it hit, where they were relative to their course, the fact that the flaps were up and the gear was down, the fact that they were tired, one o'clock in the morning, CAB never entered any of this. They wrote it off. In those days, the CAB is trying to protect the airline. They're trying to protect shareholders. They're trying to protect the investment of those airlines, those fledgling airlines trying to make it, and they want an, an airline system. So any accident, they're trying to smooth it over, cover it, cover it over, and disguise the actual probable cause. Same the same symptoms that are going on today, and that's the conclusion I have on this one. I've got the, uh, the links available in the description for this um, video. Very... Uh, very telling of the CAB in those days and the NTSB today, the common denominator is the letter B. It's a board. Uh, some of our board members are not qualified, with the exception of one that I know has the highly coveted M2 motorcycle moped endorsement, and that's uh, the best credential there. They can't figure this stuff out because they have... Each one of these cases, I'm going to show you what they missed and what the actual probable cause was. That's it for this one. It's been a fascinating four years, and I hope that you enjoy the music and uh, bluegrass uh, renditions of some of the stuff I got coming. In each one of these uh, videos that I'm going to put out here, this is going to show the same footprint. I'm just going to use the same footprint, and at the conclusion here, I'm going to show you on um, Eastern Airlines 21, the board had no previous expert experience in the subject. 
The board did, had a conflict of interest. Their board members were paid on salary to hide the truth. The board missed the important clues. They sure did. The board finds wrong probable cause. The altimeters was not the cause. The faulty go-round was the cause. Altimeters is a uh, is an unfortunate scenario that put them left wing tip into the tree, but it was totally recoverable from there. Totally, if they'd done the proper procedure. Board makes wrong recommendations, and board makes the public left safe. The board actually missed a golden opportunity to fix many, many things that were eventually fixed later on concerning crew fatigue, go-around procedures, and all that stuff that's in there. I ranted enough, and uh, i got to get this video out the door, but I appreciate you watching. Definitely, uh, thanks for uh, uh, clicking in and uh, hanging with me on the next seven. Stay tuned, and I sure appreciate you.